The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Saint Luke. Each year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the festival custom. After they had completed his days as they were returning, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Thinking that he was in the caravan, they journeyed for a day and looked for him among the relatives and acquaintances. But not finding him, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been looking for you with great anxiety. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. He went with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. Brothers and sisters, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. There is uh, something quite beautifully human, obviously, about sacred scripture, especially in the New Testament, as much as obviously it also is a spiritual reality as well. There are several occasions in sacred scripture, this being one of them, where the Lord, in speaking to Our Lady, seems to be dismissive of her concerns. Why were you looking for me? He asks his mother. Did you not know that I needed to be about my father's business and be in my father's house? He says to her at the wedding feast of Cana, woman, why is this concern mine? I always slightly chuckle because I imagine saying things similarly to my own mother and not being met with the response of faith that our Blessed Mother had. My mother was often known, God rest her soul, of reminding us who was in charge, sometimes by words, more by times by punishment. But in both instances, Our Lady's response is, not to rebuke her son for the anxiety, confusion that was caused, but instead, as St. Luke makes clear in our gospel today, to hold all of these things in her heart. And of course, that made it possible for her at the wedding feast of Cana to immediately turn to the stewards and say, do whatever it is that he commands you to do. As I said in the talk, it is that intimate union that made it possible for her to accept everything, Again, Luke testifies, and I'm sure because of what he heard from Our Lady herself, that they did not understand completely what it is that was happening. They knew who he was, after all, revealed by the message of the angel Gabriel, both to Our Lady at the Annunciation and to then St. Joseph in his own dream. But still, there was a lack of understanding because all of this, as much as we know, will always remain on one level slightly outside of our comprehension because of the depth of the wellspring of the mystery of the Incarnation, God choosing to become man, one with us in all things but sin. And so what is the proper disposition then if one's mind, if you will, is limited in comprehension? Well, again, Our Lady, the first apostle, the first disciple, models for us how we are to respond. You take these things in your heart. Not looking for clarity as much as we might want that. And yes, we're under the impression that if we understand, if we know, it will be easier for us to do the things of God. But if we're honest, we know that actually that's not true, because we do know what God asks of us. We do know 
what God wants. There's nothing hidden or secret as far as the plan of God is concerned and the path of salvation as the Lord himself has mapped it out. You must deny yourself daily, take up your cross daily, and follow after me. Unless you lose your life, you cannot hold on to it and gain it. He makes this very clear. And so we persist in somehow wanting to know or understand the mind and the things of God as if somehow that will make it easier. And yet our whole lived experience, and in truth, the lived experience of the human condition is that the more we know, the more difficult it becomes. But if we can open our hearts, as Our Lady herself did, and continues to do so, how many great things can happen? Because then there's that beautiful tableau that is created at the end of our gospel passage today. There is a lack of understanding. There is on the part of our Lord a, a clear proclamation as to who He is and what it is that He needs to be doing. It would seem that this family, this holy family, is at odds with itself. But that's not true. He goes down to Nazareth and is obedient to him. We know he learns from both mother and father who he is and how he is to be. And how profound that humility actually is that God submits himself to being taught by his own creation. So that then when the moment came for him to make his appearance in his public ministry, we know how integral his father and our blessed mother were to preparing him for that. And on their part, he being obedient to them, Our Lady specifically, and I'm sure she was a model for St. Joseph, kept all of these things in her heart. That's where it is, the heart. If time permitted us, we could do a whole discursus on what literature says to us about the heart. If just the sonnets of Shakespeare itself alone would be a good teachable moment for how the heart is viewed as that place of love. We talk about heartache and being pained in our hearts and things of that nature. So it's only natural that indeed actually the heart is that focal point, if you will, of Lord's sacred heart, but also Our Lady's immaculate heart. Those two hearts together, joined together. And what binds them together is not only the sword that pierces one heart, the sword that pierces one side, or the suffering that both of them must endure, our Lord himself the greatest upon the cross, our lady standing at the foot of that cross. But what binds those hearts together is love, a love that makes itself present and real in a life of obedience. Just as the Lord submits to them, Our Lady, we know, had already submitted in obedience to the work of the Father, taking that vow of virginity that made her ask the question of the angel Gabriel, how can this be since I do not know man? That was not a biological question she was asking. She wondered how, knowing that she had already made this commitment of perpetual virginity, how she could continue to fulfill the promises that she made to God. And God, having prepared for this from the beginning of time, knew what the answer was going to be. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. God can do great, marvelous, and wonderful things. And the more obedient we are, the easier it is for us to love. And the more we love, the easier it is for us to be obedient. When I was a much younger man, I can say that now because I've become actually an old man, not an old, old man, but I'm not a young man anymore. When I was a much younger man, I was in religious life, and I struggled, not with poverty, not with chastity, but with obedience. Even as an 18-year-old, I was always the smartest person in the room. I always knew more than my superiors, and I was just waiting for that moment when they would realize that I indeed did know more than they did. <laughs> that moment never came, but I always waited for it. And I thought to myself, as I struggled in religious life, and then eventually went on to be ordained to the priesthood, how would I ever learn to be obedient, to give my will away? Because, of course, that's what God wants. A blind, slavish obedience born of fear or doubt or despair or resignation and defeat has no place in the unfolding of salvation history. God wants freedom and love and joy and peace. All of those realities that our Blessed Mother makes manifest when she holds all of these things in her own immaculate heart. What I learned throughout my life now as I have grown older, and in, sadly oftentimes wisdom is 
wasted on the old. I wish I knew more or knew this when I was younger. The beautiful freedom that comes from obedience in doing all the things that God commands us to do. Very often now, my response to so many of my faithful, when they ask me questions that are outside of my purview, that simply is above my pay grade. I don't know. I don't want to know. I don't have to speculate. God has made very clear what it is that I need to do and how I need to accomplish. The more narrow, the more circumscribed my focus is, the greater I can cooperate with the grace of God for the salvation of the souls entrusted to my care. And now I understand the beauty of obedience, this virtue that is rooted in listening to God, hearing what God has to say long before a life of execution. And again, our Blessed Mother, that perfect exemplar, because we know from, her own, from the moment of her own dedication in the temple through the hands of Saints Joachim and Anne, she went there daily to pray and to praise God, to be in His presence, to listen to His voice, so that whenever and whatever was going to be asked of her, her answer would only and always and immediately be yes. And that's precisely what happened. And so when she comes to us and speaks to us about the triumph of her immaculate heart, we already have abundant evidence of that because of her first act of cooperation with the grace of God by accepting the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. By following all of that as she watched her son go forth and teach and then be mocked and ridiculed and then the greatest of scandals to be put to death. But never despaired, never wavered. Even when our Lord was abandoned by his most intimate associates, our lady and the beloved disciple remained. Love, obedience, and a heart full of both, so powerful and overflowing, that then she was invited to continue this great work, this great mission given into the hands of the beloved disciple so that we likewise might be able to receive this great gift that has been bestowed upon us. And so the Immaculate Heart of Our Lady, as we know, is that place to which we go to find strength that it is needed, to certainly model ourselves after her. There are times when we must throw ourselves upon that very heart, maybe worn out as we are, beaten down by the world in which we live. And you know as well as I, there are so many things arrayed against us, both outside of the church and even, sadly, in the life of Holy Mother Church herself. There may be at times, seemingly, seemingly, more causes for sadness than there are for joy. But brothers and sisters, we have to look beyond the human in the natural, to the supernatural, and that which God has accomplished, and the role that Our Lady plays in that which has successfully happened. Because sin and death have been conquered once and for all, not will be conquered, not are going to be conquered, not something that is only future-oriented, but something that happens here and now. In a few moments, the living God, who is present in the Most Blessed Sacrament, will make Himself present and available to us on the altar of sacrifice. That's a continuation, not a repeating, not a reenactment, not some, if you will, pale comparison of what actually was, but a continuation of it so that the merits of the cross are made available to us here and now. And so like Our Lady, there are times when we must take things into our hearts. I won't understand. I won't always know. It won't always make sense to me. But God never promised you any of those things. What He did promise you was that He would love you until the consummation of the age, that He would send you the Holy Spirit to be advocate and teacher and consoler, that if you ate His flesh and drank His blood, you would have abundant life within you, and that all who held to Him and all who sought Him, all who believed in Him, all who listened to Him would be drawn into that union of Father, Son, and Spirit. And there is our Blessed Mother, this linchpin, if you will, who freely, willingly, joyfully submits to what God asks her to do and never once wavers or falters. 
And so what is required of us, if you will, if we wanted to pinpoint some signs of our own devotion to the Immaculate Heart of our Blessed Mother? The first is a a disposition of contemplation, because we oftentimes forget that before we do, we kind of need to be. And sometimes we need to simply sit in the presence of the living God, sit and be with Our Lady. That's the beauty of reciting the rosary on on a daily basis. It creates and opens up all of those opportunities to contemplate the maternal love of our Blessed Mother. What a great gift that love is to us. Not again was, but is precisely now. And then through that act of contemplation, entrust ourselves over and over again to our Blessed Mother. Again, as a young man, I would never have been able to give voice to this experience of what it means to entrust myself to Our Lady. But now I know without a shadow of a doubt that all the ways that I have been blessed, even in the midst of difficult situations in my priestly life, it's precisely in those moments when I said, I cannot do this, but I know that my mother can. Sometimes it was born of being defeated. I had nowhere else to go or no one to whom I could turn. And other times it was an immediate response, born of an awareness of what she has done for me and what it is that she continues to do for me. But you don't have to take my word for it. I know everyone here listening to my voice here for prayer, everyone has an experience of Our Lady. You know what it is that she has done for you. Whether it has been one time that came and went, or whether it has been a daily occurrence interceding for you or those that you love, or in situations that were beyond your control, and somehow there was peace. Somehow there was calm. Somehow there was success. Not viewed in human ways, but viewed only through the eyes and the lens of faith. And so we entrust ourselves to Our Lady. And then, in that act of entrusting ourselves to Our Lady, we actually pray that our hearts can disappear and be replaced with that maternal heart, that immaculate heart, so that in the fullness of time, we can also then allow it to rest comfortably with our Lord's sacred heart. What do we hear in that Old Testament passage? Getting rid of the stony, hard hearts, and allowing a heart truly full of love to rest in us? fulfilled in Our Lady, made manifest, of course, in Our Lord. But notice the process from contemplation to an act of entrustment to then an act of seeking to lose oneself in order to be able to completely find oneself. Two other things for our reflection. An intimacy with Our Lady if we were to choose to do so through an act of consecration. You know from the writings of both St. Louis de Montfort and St. Maximilian Colby, one of my great heroes in the spiritual life, both of them cautiously tell us to enter into consecration with eyes wide open, because much is asked of you if you consecrate yourself to Our Lady. It's not a fleeting act of piety. It is an act of piety, but not a fleeting one because it requires from us a daily commitment to put all of this into practice. My greatest comfort, brothers and sisters, is that in those moments when I fail to do so, I know that I will never be abandoned as much as I might deserve it. In those moments where it might be easier for me to deny our Lord or to abandon Him as the disciples did because of things swirling around me or because of my own laziness or my own indifference, even if I might succumb to that, going to His sacred heart to receive mercy and compassion, I know that I'm yet again in union with the Immaculate Heart of Our Lady who will help me be just a little bit better for this day and maybe just for this moment. St. John Paul II, you know from the biography about him, was called the witness to hope. When I first read that tome, and it took me a while to read it, it's a rather thick book, I found that I was, I just couldn't kind of get into it, if you will. I knew of the life of St. John Paul II. Of course, you can see how his life was indeed a witness to hope. But there is, in, in a way, a subtle exhortation for all of us to be witnesses to hope. And in truth, if we are close 
to the Immaculate Heart of our Blessed Mother, there is no other disposition that we actually can have. You must, you must be men and women of a fervent hope. You cannot be discouraged by the world in which we live, even if everything says to us that we should be discouraged. You can never doubt the power of the words of God, but most especially the Word of God Himself. Because the living God is here. He has always remained with us. He has never abandoned us or left us bereft. And He is indeed triumphant. He is King of kings, Lord of lords. And we, especially in the celebration of the Holy Sacrifice, are invited to take our place in His kingdom. So don't seek understanding. You don't have to be stupid, but you don't have to know everything either. Don't rely upon this knowledge, if you will, to give you some insight. Instead, be obedient. And even when it's hard to be obedient, draw close to Our Lady. And in all things, follow her example, keeping all of these things in your own hearts. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.